Hello and welcome back. For this lecture we're going to talk about the respiratory system. The respiratory system consists of all the parts that bring air in and that transport those parts to the microscopic alveoli where gases are exchanged. Um, this is a really critical system. Uh, without the system we don't live and uh, so um, let's go ahead and talk about some of the terms that we need to get straight. So uh, respiration is going to be the uh, entire process of, process of exchanging gases between the atmosphere and body cells. So when we talk about the respiratory system, these, these particular terms that I'm fleshing out for you right here are, are used and I, I want you to make sure you don't get them confused. So respiration, when we say respiration, we mean the entire process of exchanging gases between the atmosphere and the cells of your body. When we talk about ventilation, we're talking about the physical movement of air into and out of the lungs. So that's what ventilation means. Then when we talk about gas exchange, gas exchange is the movement of gases across the respiratory membrane um, and into the blood cells or, uh, or into the lungs, depending upon which way it's going. So that's what we call for gas exchange. And then lastly, there is a term called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is where we use oxygen that we bring in from the respiratory system and also the food that we eat uh, to make uh, or generate ATP, which is that cellular energy that all cells use to do their work. So it's important that you get these terms straight from one another so you don't get them mixed up and uh, confused. So let's go ahead and we'll talk about the anatomy of the respiratory system. So the organs of the respiratory system can be divided into two groups. We have our upper respiratory tract, and this will include the nose, the nasal cavity, the sinuses, and the pharynx. And then we have the lower respiratory tract, and this will include the larynx, uh, which also includes the, uh, the vocal fold, uh, folds uh, or cords, uh, the trachea, the bronchial tree, and the lungs. Just looking at kind of a generic diagram here, we have up here the upper respiratory system or upper respiratory tract. So we have the nose, and we're going to talk about each of these parts very specifically. We have the nasal cavity, there are also sinuses involved, and then the back of the throat or the pharynx. So if you ever have an upper respiratory infection, it's going to be an infection in one of these particular parts. Lower respiratory tract or lower respiratory system is going to... Um, be including the so it's going to be including the larynx, the trachea, the bronchus, the lungs. Okay, the little smaller bronchial tubes are called bronchioles, and eventually the alveoli, which are the little air sacs that we have gas exchange in. All right, well, let's start with the nose. <clears throat> so the nose is supported by uh, bone. We have the dorsum of the nose up here is supported by two bones, the nasal bones, and uh, it's also supported by cartilage. So we have the nasal cartilages made of hyaline cartilage that uh, help to give a framework um, for you know to support the and to keep open the nares or the nostrils. So um, this provides uh, an entrance for air. Um, it also inside of this um, inside the nasal cavity. There are going to be lots of hairs that are going to filter um, the, the air that's coming in. So we do have nose hairs that protrude out, and those help to filter out particles uh, uh, that are trying to get into, um, into our nasal cavity. So the nasal cavity is a space posterior to the nose, and uh, it's divided medially by the nasal septum. Uh, the nasal septum is created by the, um, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and the, uh, the vomer bone. So um, inside of the nasal cavity, there are uh, nasal conchi that are divided in, uh, that divide the passage um, into uh, various spaces. Um, these particular nasal conchi are going to be uh, lined over the surface of them with a uh, mucous membrane. So these are going to help to, uh, you know, these folds, if you remember, the nasal con uh, conchi are kind of like scroll-like bones, and they are going to aid in increasing the surface area that that mucous membrane covers. 
So if you increase the surface area, then you increase the job that that mucous membrane is doing. And that, that mucous membrane has many different jobs. One of the jobs is to warm the air that comes into, um, into your nasal cavity. It's also going to filter the incoming air, and it's going to moisten the air as well. So if you ever get punched in the nose, or have seen somebody punched in the nose, because there's so much mucous membrane, and because there's so many capillaries there feeding that, you know, underlying that mucous membrane, it's a, it's a, to, to warm and, and moisten and, and filter the air, um, there's a tremendous amount of blood there. So a bloody nose is uh, something that uh, will bleed a lot. So um, this mucous membrane is a mucous membrane. It produces mucus. And so um, that helps to trap particles in the air that we're breathing in. And the mucus that's, uh, that traps the particles will move um, because there are cilia uh, in that uh, mucous membrane. The little cilia will sweep the mucus towards the pharynx. And when you move that mucus to, toward the pharynx, um, that, that will allow you to swallow that mucus, and it'll be carried down to the stomach where you have gastric acid, gastric juice, um, that's waiting to destroy any microorganisms that might be uh, within that mucus. This is an odd picture, and uh, I like this picture because it's, a, it's a, essentially a frontal section. If you look at the section right here, it's a frontal section through the face, and I guess a little part of the cranium up here. And uh, to kind of orient you here, of course, we have the eyes. So we have the eyes right here and right here. And it goes through the nose. What's kind of cool is you can see some of the sinuses there. It's the maxillary sinus there. Here we have the frontal sinus up here in the frontal bone. But um, it allows you to see the, um, the, the various parts of the nasal cavity. So we do have the nasal septum made of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and the vomer. So they're making up this like divide between the two sides right here. And then we can see the, uh, the various nasal concha. Here's the middle nasal concha. Here's the inferior nasal concha. But they're scroll-like bones. And then we have the superior nasal concha. These are scroll-like bones that, that that mucous membrane will line to, um, to increase the surface area so that it can do the job of filtering, warming, and moistening the air that, uh, that comes in through the, through the nose. So all along the, the, the passageway of our respiratory system, we're going to have ciliated epithelium. Uh, in the trachea, it's going to be pseudostratified ciliary, ciliary epithelium. And, uh, and uh, so this is what the cilia look like. And they're like brooms or sweepers, and they sweep the mucus. Um, you know, uh, in the trachea, they're going to sweep it up into the uh, pharynx. And if it's up here in the nasal cavity, they sweep it down into the pharynx so that you can swallow that and take it down to the stomach and, and rid your body of microorganisms that might be trapped in it. So we do have sinuses. They're called the paranasal sinuses, and these are air-filled spaces within the various bones. We have them in the so we have maxillary sinuses, frontal sinuses, ethmoid, ethmoidal sinuses, and sphenoidal sinuses, and all of these are are uh, open air spaces that are open and continuous with the nasal cavity. Um, these spaces are going to be lined with mucous membrane, and uh, so and it's continuous with the with the epithelium of the of the um, nasal cavity. So um, so anything that comes to your nasal cavity can go up into the sinuses, and uh, these are basically sp uh, fluid filled uh, air filled spaces that uh, that will help to filter, moisten, and uh, and warm the air that we're breathing in. The sinuses uh, serve uh, multiple roles. One of the roles is to reduce the weight of the skull, uh, and they also uh, re uh, serve as a, a resonant chamber for uh, you know, taking and changing the quality of our voices. But they also warm, moisten, and, and filter the air as well. Of course, when you get one of those sinuses blocked, um, that will cause, you know, perhaps there's a bacteria growing inside and will cause a sinus infection. Um, the reason you have pain when you have a blocked uh, sinus is that the uh, cells lining the sinus will actually absorb air that's in the cavity and uh, cause a negative pressure to form inside that cavity. That negative pressure is sensed by us typically as pain. So the pharynx is the back of the throat, and uh, it's a common passageway for air and food. 
Uh, it aids in transporting sounds for speech. And it's going to house the tonsils, which are part of the immune system. And if we take a look at, uh, at some of these parts here, um, we can see some of these structures. So we had the nasal conchi that are up here. We had the superior, middle, and inferior. These are folds of skin that are uh, allowing for the moistening, the, the, the filtering, and the, the warming of uh, air. So kind of moving on down a, a little bit further, we have the pharynx. And there's different portions of the pharynx here. We have the nasopharynx, which is the nasal portion of the pharynx. We have the oropharynx, which is kind of like the oral part of the pharynx. And we have the laryngeopharynx, which is the part that, of the pharynx that goes near, um, near the larynx, which is your voice box. And uh, just to highlight uh, a couple of things there, so in your, um, in your, uh, your pharynx, you do have uh, tonsils. So we have here the palatine tonsil that's back here, and this is part of the immune system. Okay, so we're going to move on down and we're going to talk about the larynx and the trachea. Those will be our next parts that we'll kind of talk about. I think it is kind of interesting though, you probably have had the circumstance where you have taken food into your oral cavity and then if you're laughing while you drink or eat food, sometimes it'll come out of your nose. And the reason they can do that is because of the pharynx. Um, the pharynx is going to be, um, you know, it's, it's going to go down into uh, into this area, but it also goes up into the nasal area. So there is a common connection or passageway. So you can breathe air through your mouth because of the pharynx being a common passageway. And, uh, and you can also breathe through your nostrils as well because of this common passageway. So the larynx is an enlargement in the airway. Uh, superior to the trachea, so it's above the trachea, and it's inferior or below the, uh, the pharynx. It helps to keep particles from entering the trachea and also houses the vocal cords. If we take a look at the, at the larynx, uh, this is kind of what it looks like. So we, we do have uh, a, an anterior view and a posterior view of these particular uh, parts here. So an anterior view, one of the large components you can see um, will be the Adam's apple or the thyroid cartilage. Okay, so it's located right there, right above the thyroid gland, which is this gland right here. So that cartilage is uh, protective. It uh, protects so that the trachea doesn't collapse and the, the airway that is behind it doesn't collapse. <clears throat> there is a there is you know connective tissue that connects it to the uh, hyoid bone, which to help helps to give it strength and uh, and structure. Um, this cartilage is going to be made of hyaline cartilage. On the back side of it, you can see uh, this epiglottis, so we can see it a little bit better right here. And this is a, a cartilaginous uh, part that uh, basically, when, every time you swallow, it covers over the trachea so that food doesn't go into the trachea, but yet it, it guides the food down into the esophagus. So on the back side, you can see this, uh, this cricoid cartilage here. And then you can see these little rings, these little tracheal cartilage rings here. Again, these help to support the airway to give it uh, great strength. Inside the larynx, there are two pairs of uh, uh, folds of muscle and connective tissue that are covered by a mucous membrane, and these make up what we call the vocal cords. The upper pair of vocal cords are called the fa false vocal cords, and the lower pair are called the true vocal cords. Changing tension on the vocal cords will change our pitch, um, so and uh, it can also uh, increase the loudness, and uh, and uh, and uh, also if we force air across those vibrating vocal cords, we can change uh, all different kinds of characteristics of our voice. During normal breathing, the vocal cords are relaxed and they're open, and there is a, a an opening called the glottis that. Uh, that uh, allows air to flow in. During swallowing, the false vocal cords and the epiglottis are going to close off the glottis so that food doesn't go into the respiratory tract. 
And this is just showing you a picture of the vocal cords in a frontal section. So uh, we've cut through the trachea and you can see that there is muscle tissue there. This is the muscle tissue of the vocal cord. So here would be the vocal cord right here and it's covered by mucus, mucus uh, it's covered by epithelium tissue. It also has uh, some cartilage in there, connective tissue, and then it has a little bit of um, muscle tissue so that it can change um, its shape. So these are what vocal cords look like, uh, I guess, from uh, artist rendition. So if we take a look at uh, the vocal cords through, through a laryngoscope, um, we can see that uh, this is what we would consider to be abduction, so moving away from each other. Adduction is where they move towards each other, so you can close that thing off altogether, or you can cause it to become wider, and that changes the quality of the voice that you're um, creating. This is what it actually looks like through uh, when you use that laryngoscope and, uh, and take a look at it. Um, so this is a real vocal cord, so you can see the vocal fold there. And uh, you can see the glottis is open, so that open space there is the glottis that's, um, that's open. <clears throat> so our next anatomical part is the trachea. The trachea extends downward anterior to the esophagus. So your esophagus is behind the trachea, and then the trachea is in the front. So if you felt your throat in the front, there's little bumps right there. Um, going down towards your sternum, those little bumps there are the cartilage um, that's, that's covering over the trachea. Behind that is the esophagus. Um, so the trachea extends downward, it's anterior to the esophagus, and uh, it goes into the thoracic cavity where it's going to split into your right and left bronchi. These are tubes that will go into your right and left lungs respectively. The inner wall of the trachea is lined with ciliated mucous membrane with many goblet cells and uh, and these goblet cells produce mucus and they serve as a uh, that mucus serves as a, a substance that traps incoming particles and uh, organisms. So this is just uh, looking at a uh, transverse section of the um, of the trachea. So we've cut a little section of it out here. You can see that posteriorly we find the esophagus and then anteriorly we find um, the actual trachea. So it's just kind of showing you the trachea. There is a luminum or lumen or the the, the airspace. Um, there is um, you know an epithelium there that is going to um, uh, be a mucous membrane, and then we have glands there that are producing mucus in addition to the um, the, mu the goblet cells or mucus cells, and then there's cartilage that's giving great support to that. If you collapse that airway, if this airway collapses in, then uh, basically you'll suffocate. So you can see that the trachea extends from the larynx all the way down to where it begins to split or bifurcate into your right bronchus and your left bronchus. This is what the epithelium looks like. So we have uh, an epithelium that uh, is uh, ciliated and uh, it does have uh, mucus cells or goblet cells there that produce mucus. There are stem cells there waiting to replace any cells that are damaged or destroyed. We do have mucus glands that produce mucus and, and secrete that mucus onto the surface. And uh, you can see it's ciliated and that sweeping motion is going to sweep things up and out of the trachea towards the pharynx so that you can swallow it and, uh, and kill the organisms that might be in it. So the bronchial tree consists of branches uh, of uh, actually branch tubes, uh, and they lead from the trachea to the uh, little air sacs called the alveoli. The bronchial tree begins with two primary bronchi, each leading to a lung. The branches of the bronchial tree from the trachea are the left and right primary bronchi, and these further subdivide into bronchioles, which give rise to uh, alveolar ducts and then terminate in the alveolar air sacs. So it's just like a tree to increase the surface area because there's lots of alveoli, we keep on branching over and over and over. 
Um, once we once the air gets down to these little alveoli, there's a little thin membrane in the alveoli which is going to allow for the, the exchange of um, gases uh, between the blood and the air that's inside of that, um, that little sac. And this just shows you the right and left lung. Remember in anatomical position, right and left are you know from the perspective of the of the of the person so here we have the trachea coming in we have the splitting of the bronchi into the right bronchi and the left bronchi and then you can see they sub further subdivide there are three main uh, bronchial you know, trees in the uh, right lung so you can see these you know in different colors the brown the green and the blue and there's two primary trees inside of the left lung the right lung does have three lobes the left lung does have two lobes there's a little notch cut out, cut out right there so that the heart can sit a little bit too toward the left side so the trachea does branch it branch, branches into the left bronchi or bronchus um, there are you know cartilage plates all along to support this airway so it doesn't collapse so we basically keep on branching into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually you know we terminate and uh, enter into the alveoli okay so it branches and branches and branches again to increase the surface area so um, that respiration can be efficient um, these are very complex uh, parts as you can see in this particular diagram um, so we can see that uh, that there's muscle tissue around these bronchi there's, that muscle tissue can constrict and it can dilate thus increasing or decreasing the the um, size of the airway um, these particular structures are tremendously vascular okay so there's tons and tons of blood vessels that are um, that are flowing down um, um, these particular uh, tubes uh, you can see there's tons and tons of capillaries there's lymphatic vessels, there's nerves that all go down to these air sacs. So these air sacs, every one of these little grape-like structures, these little air sacs, uh, are going to be covered in uh, capillaries. So we can see here a branch of the pulmonary, um, the, a branch of the pulmonary vein that's going to carry blood, you know, t back towards the heart, and we have branches of the pulmonary artery that's bringing blood from the heart to the to the lungs to become oxygenated. Alright, so once we get down to these alveoli, it's important that you understand that the alveoli have some, some uh, major characteristics that make them good for gas exchange. So the alveoli are thin, the alveoli are numerous, there's a huge amount of surface area, and the alveoli are covered by uh, capillaries. Okay, so you might want to look, for, you know, but don't be on autopilot, but write those down. There's three main reasons why the alveoli are, are good at gas exchange. So they're thin, they're numerous, so there's a lot of them, and they have lots of blood supply. So a tremendous amount of blood supply uh, is covering, um, covering them. Okay, uh, it, it's stated somewhere. I've read somewhere that if the alveoli, all the alveoli in your air, in your in your lungs, if they were laid out flat, they would cover the surface of a tennis court. So I'm sure you've played tennis before or seen a tennis court. That's a tremendous amount of surface area through which gas exchange can occur. Okay, so these pictures are beautiful. They show that the the alveoli are uh, hollow. They're thin, lots of capillaries that are covering them, and if you take a look at them um, through a section here, this is a little histo histological section of it, you can kind of get a sense of what they look like. So they're very thin-walled, and, um, and there's a tremendous amount of air spaces that are inside these, um, these alveoli. Now you do have a right and left lung. And they're, uh, you know, if you were to feel them, they're going to be soft and spongy. They're kind of conical in shape, and uh, they're separated medially by the uh, mediastinum, and they're enclosed um, uh, inferiorly by the diaphragm. And the thoracic cage uh, surrounds them in all three dimensions around them. The bronchus and the large blood vessels uh, are going to enter each of the lungs. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like in just a second. Um, there is visceral pleura, going back to 
the Biology 141, uh, we talked about membranes. So they're they're um, uh, you know in cavities lined by these membranes. The visceral pleura is the membrane that's going to uh, adhere to and attach to the surface of the lung. The parietal pleura is going to line the thoracic cavity. And in between there, there's a fluid, a serous fluid, that lubricates and reduces friction inside of that, uh, of that pleural cavity. So the right lung, as I indicated before, has three lobes. The left lung has two. Each lobe is composed of lobules that contain air passages, alveoli, nerves, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and connective tissues. So here's your uh, a view uh, of the right lung and left lung. So this is the right lung over here. You can see there is the apex, kind of the top of the conical portion. There's a base to the lung. And then there are, uh, in the right lung, there are several fissures. We have an oblique fissure and we have a horizontal fissure. And these fissures separate out the lobes. So we have the superior lobe, the middle lobe, and then we have the, um, the inferior lobe of the right lung. So over here we have the left lung. We only have the oblique fissure, fissure but we do have a cardiac notch that, um, where the heart can kind of sit a little closer to the left side. So we do have a superior lobe and an inferior lobe of the left lung. So if you take and cut uh, the lung um, in a kind of like a, a coronal cut, uh, you can see that the, in a kind of in the um, in the center there, there is that hilum that allows for the passageway of the bronchi, pulmonary vessels, nerves, lymphatics. That's how they enter into the lung, and then they branch out from that point in time, or from that point or location. This is a kind of a cut through, a transverse cut through, and we're looking at a kind of a, a, a top view of that. And uh, again, you can see that there is visceral pleura. Let me change the color of my ink here. So there's visceral pleura covering the lung. There's parietal pleura that lines the wall of the thoracic cavity. And then we have in between that serous fluid that helps to lubricate um, the the um, the two membranes so they don't stick to each other. If you uh, do have those things stick to each other, like when a baby's born and it doesn't create uh, this chemical called surfactant, um, those two membranes will stick to each other and the baby will suffocate. So premature babies have to be put on a respirator because they pr they don't produce the the fluid in between those membranes and those membranes will stick together when it breathes air. All right, so let's talk about the breathing mechanism for, for just a minute. So ventilation means breathing. It's the physical movement of air into and out of the lungs, and it's composed of, uh, of two major components, inspiration and expiration. So sitting on you right now is a wall of air, and, uh, and it physically has, you know, it can be measured at 760 millimeters of, uh, of mercury pressure. And that atmospheric pressure is the force that moves air into the lungs. So if your pressure inside your lungs is less than atmospheric pressure, it'll naturally move in very easily. If the pressure inside of your lungs is greater, though, air will be forced out of your lungs because it's greater than the pressure of air sitting on top of you. So when pressure on the inside of the lungs decreases, the higher air pressure will move into your lungs from the outside. It's just a physical movement. Air pressure inside the lungs can be decreased by increasing the size of the thoracic cavity. It can, um, so, and due to the surface tension between the two layers of the pleura, the lungs uh, will follow the chest wall. So if you expand the chest wall, there will be a surface tension between the, the two plur uh, pleural layers that will cause the lungs to increase in size along with the chest wall. So there are muscles involved in expanding the thoracic cavity. These include the diaphragm and your external intercostal muscles. Um, you can go online and there's all kinds of nice little videos that show you models of this working. So take a look at a, one of those things, one of those uh, views uh, from the internet. And uh, I'll try to put one on uh, Blackboard for you to take a look at. So as the lungs expand in size, uh, surfactant will keep the alveoli from sticking to each other so they do not collapse when the internal air pressure is low. So um, 
So we do have uh, a, a fluid that's produced inside the alveoli, which uh, which doesn't allow them to stick together and collapse when you have really low pl pressure inside of your inside of your lungs. During um, expiration, this is uh, going to be due to elastic recoil of the lung. There are also muscle tissues um, and surface tension within your alveoli that are going to help you to expire. Forced expiration is aided by thoracic and abdominal wall muscles that can compress the abdomen against the diaphragm and therefore make your thoracic cavity have less space inside of it, thus you can force air out of the lungs. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of these little diagrams here. So, so here we're seeing that atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, and if your if your pressure inside your lung is less than that, air will move into the lungs. If your pressure is greater than 760 millimeters of mercury, then you you will have air that will be forced out of your lungs. So at rest. The rib cage and diaphragm are going to create a pressure that's going to equal the pressure outside. So atmospheric pressure and inside uh, pressure inside the lungs is going to equal when you're at rest. During inhalation, you're going to have um, several things that are going to occur. The diaphragm is going to move downward. So thus increasing the size of the thoracic cavity. The pressure outside is going to be greater than the pressure inside because when that diaphragm drops, the, the size of the thoracic cavity increases and it decreases the pressure inside of that cavity. So you can see the diaphragm is decreasing. We do have external intercostal muscles that are going to be contracting, thus increasing the size of the thoracic cavity. We have some accessory respiratory muscles, the sternocleidomastoid, the scalene, scalenes, the uh, pectoralis minor, and serratus anterior. These also can contract to increase the size of the thoracic cavity. Remember, when you increase the size of uh, the cavity, it decreases the pressure inside of it. Think if you squeeze on a, a two-liter bottle of soda. When you squeeze on it, it decreases the size of the cavity inside, thus it squirts the water out. But if you relax the sides of the bottle, it decreases the pressure inside of the bottle. The same thing occurs inside of your thoracic cavity. So during exhalation, you can see the diaphragm is going to rise and so therefore the pressure outside is less than the pressure inside so air will move out of your of your um, out of your lungs um, so there are some muscles that help us uh, to do that the transversus thor uh, thorac thoracus and also we have internal intercostal muscles and the rectus abdominis. These can, uh, can uh, decrease the size of the thoracic cavity. And this is just a side-by-side -side comparison of the muscles of inhalation and the muscles of exhalation. So you can see how they're working. So muscles of exhalation are decreasing the size of the thoracic cavity. Muscles of inhalation or increase in the size of the thoracic cavity. And that's just showing you the diaphragm. During inhalation, the diaphragm drops, so it increases the size of the thoracic cavity, thus decreasing the pressure. During exhalation, the diaphragm rises, and that helps to decrease the size of the thoracic cavity so that you can push air out of the lungs. So you can measure all the different kinds of air volumes. This measurement of air volumes is called spirometry, and it describes four distinct respiratory volumes. Um, so respiratory therapists will, will study these intensely because this is the, you know, the nature of their work. So one inspiration followed by an expiration is called a respiratory cycle. The amount of air that enters or leaves the lungs during one respiratory cycle is called tidal volume. So that's one key um, value that you're, you know, responsible for knowing for, you know, testing purposes.
Okay, so the amount of air that enters or leaves the lungs during one respiratory cycle is called the tidal volume. During forced inspiration, an additional volume called the inspiratory reserve volume can be inhaled into the lungs. And so inspiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume gives us the inspiratory capacity. During a maximal forced expiration, an expiratory reserve volume can be exhaled, but there remains a residual volume in the lungs. Adding the two of these together gives us the functional reserve capacity. Okay, so these are terms that you'll be responsible for knowing, so you'll need to go back and review those and make sure you look at them in your notes. So the vital capacity is the tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve and expiratory reserve volumes combined. So that means your vital capacity. Vital capacity plus residual volume is the total lung capacity. I think it's probably easier to kind of look at a graph of some of these kinds of things. So um, you get a sense of here what the tidal volume looks like that's your you know your uh, inspiration your normal inspiration expiration and, and how much air is coming into and out of so here we have inspiratory reserve volume expiratory reserve volume we have residual volume so all those things we talked about you can see that those things can be recorded on a graph so here we see an exhalation so we're basically decreasing the amount of air inside here we're having an inhalation so we can see that we're increasing the amount of air that's inside and then we have various kinds of things so you can see the total lung capacity is everything combined so you know inspiratory reserve volume uh, inspiratory reserve volume expiratory reserve volume and tidal volume make up your vital capacity Okay, so get a sense of looking at this and go back and look at your definitions for those particular volumes. These volumes are really important though because, um, you know, in order to see if someone is responding to asthma medicine or if someone does have asthma or is having breathing problems, you have to be able to monitor and record the volumes of these various uh, aspects of the lungs. So it is, these are very important, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, measurements to be able to understand. So normal breathing is a rhythmic uh, involuntary act and uh, it's going to be done by muscles that are under um, under the control of uh, uh, parts of your brain. So there are muscles that you voluntary, voluntarily control um, so when when you're thinking about breathing you can control it but normally it's under rhythmic involuntary uh, control there is a respiratory center these are uh, basically groups of neurons in the brainstem that are going to comprise the respiratory um, center and these will control the breathing they'll control inspiration and expiration by adjusting the rate and depth of the breathing so we do have various places inside of the brainstem with they control different aspects of uh, of breathing we have in the uh, medulla we have the uh, rhythmicity center and then we have pneumotactic regions in the pons so the rhythmicity center in the medulla uh, includes two different groups of neurons we have the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group the dorsal respiratory group is responsible for basic rhythm of breathing and the ventral respiratory group is active when more forceful breathing is required neurons in the pneumotactic uh, area of the pons control the rate of breathing and so you can just see that there are you know the various places in the pons and the medulla that uh, you have these groups of neurons that are going to be active in um, in controlling various aspects of breathing you can see that these things are going to send signals down to various nerves um, to control various uh, muscles involved in uh, in breathing such as the diaphragm and your external intercostal muscles There are many factors that affect breathing. There are 
chemicals that you can inhale that of course can infect breathing such as uh, if you have an inhaler uh, there's you'll be inhaling something such as epinephrine that can can uh, can affect breathing um, but there's also smoke and other things that can affect breathing as well the way that your lung tissue stretches can affect breathing emotional state uh, will also affect breathing as well there are chemo uh, receptors that uh, are found in um, in various places like the respiratory center of the brain and these are sensitive to changes in uh, blood concentration of carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions so e if either carbon dioxide or hydrogen ion concentrations rise then the central chemoreceptors in these areas uh, are going to increase the rate of breathing so they're sensing that something's going on in the body and they can respond by increasing uh, breathing we also have uh, peripheral chemoreceptors in your uh, various places in your carotid arteries and aortic arch um, in your aorta and these can sense changes in blood oxygen concentration and they can transmit those impulses to the respiratory center and uh, breathing rate and tidal volume uh, can change based on these uh, oxygen levels. We do have an inflation, uh, inflation reflex that's triggered by stretch receptors in the visceral pleura, but also your bronchial tubes and alveoli, and these will help to prevent overinflation of the lungs during really forceful breathing. Okay, I think what we'll do is we'll stop here and uh, we'll come back next time and talk about gas exchange and, uh, and get into um, other aspects of the respiratory physiology. So until then, I will see you next time.